Okay, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and good night, colleagues. <laughs> A warm welcome for Bangkok, UNSCAP, um, to the third session of our ongoing um, conference discussion expert group meeting on building forward fairer. Um, we're trying to focus on uh, policies that can help countries recover in a manner that promotes uh, an inclusive recovery and inclusive development. Today is this is one is session three, and it will be focusing on the all important issue of fiscal response to inequality. Um, what is the role of fiscal policy in mitigating inequalities and particularly with a special focus on likely fiscal consolidation and their impact on inequalities? Would it be improving it or worsening it? This is probably the most important issue these days in the macro policy circles, uh, both in terms of whether fiscal policy has a role in recovery and most more importantly in recovery in a manner that actually promotes inclusive development and, more, and the, at the same time um, when and how much fiscal consolidation, if needed, should be introduced and how to go about doing that, again keeping in view its impact on the inclusiveness aspect of uh, uh, the, the the objectives of policymakers. So we are joined today with a very, very exciting panel, a set of speakers and panelists. I'll introduce them in a little more detail, but let me at least mention who we have today. Uh, we are honored to have Ms. Christina Duarte, Under Secretary General, Special Advisor on Africa to the United Nations and to the United Nations Secretary General and a previous Minister of Finance, Republic of Cape Verde. Then we also are joined by Mr. Jonathan Ostre. He is the Deputy Director of the Asia and the Pacific Department and the International Monetary Fund and a research fellow at the Center for Economic Policy and Research. We are also joined by Professor Sang Hyop Lee from the University of Hawaii at Manao and East West Center. And last but not least, we are also joined by Ms. Sally Torbert, Senior Program Officer at International Budget Partnership. Before we get to our speakers, let me invite my colleague Mihal Podolsky to set us off with a basic presentation on the issues. Mihal, over to you. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, as Hamza noted, I will just present you a few minutes presentation to set the scene and uh, just to uh, remind us to be focused on uh, the topic. So uh, let me share the screen. I hope everybody can see now. So. Uh, we would like to be focused here on four points. So first, just to um, uh, remind that growth, poverty, reduction and inequality, these are three different stories which we would like to them to go together in good direction, but often they don't. Uh, then we would like to discuss it all in the COVID context because this is what matters most to us now and on how to build forward fairer and better from the point we are now in. Uh, three, uh, building fairer and forward, we want to use the research uh, on fiscal policies and what we found on how they worked and how they impact inequalities in the past. And uh, last, I uh, would like to think what to do with the current policies, how to redesign them, target better and make them more efficient. So coming back to point one, uh, stressing that inequality reduction and poverty reduction Although we often think about them as the same because they impact the, the people at the bottom of economic pyramid, they follow a different paths. So for Asia Pacific, uh, we see in the last 30 years that poverty has been declining on many thresholds, although not to the extent we wish, but it was. But when it comes about inequalities in the middle graph, especially for the large countries like China, India, Bangladesh, uh, we uh, observe not that great picture. In the in the third slide on the left, on the right, you see the case of China, for example. So the blue line uh, is the extreme poverty in China. The bottom black line, the continuous one, is the inequality in China. And the dotted lines is the same in, is inequality measured for rural and urban areas. So we see that has something happened what we we're not expect, what we didn't. Um, maybe we might have been expecting, but we are not happy with. But it will be also drop the lens of population size, so we don't focus on the largest countries in the region only. But take a look on overall image. We see that there is there are many countries which 
manage to decrease the inequalities? And this is where the first uh, questions start to arise. What happened there that they managed to do this? How they did this? And uh, in contrast, what, what didn't happen in these larger countries that inequalities went up. Coming back to the COVID-19 contest, uh, we and fiscal space, we observed that fiscal expenditures went up across all Asia Pacific countries. So in the graph, the circles represent the countries of Asia Pacific. Uh, X axis is 2019, 2021 on Y axis. So in almost all the cases, we see that expenditures went up. This is related to the fiscal packages to, uh, and crisis uh, response. So uh, there is nothing unexpected. And when we see the another three graphs on the fiscal space, so the first one from the left is the revenue of the countries. So in the best cases, it's almost unchanged. In many cases, it actually declined. Uh, in the middle graph, you see uh, the budget deficits, which deepened. The circles again are ESCA member states. Dots are other countries in the world, so it's nothing unique for the region. And the first graph from the right, uh, this is that. Again, circles is ESCAP and dots is the rest of the world. So uh, we are moving to much uh, tighter fiscal space. And we need to think how to allocate our resources uh, and how to change them. So what fiscal policies are needed and where? So coming to where as a um, something what we somehow know but often forget. Uh, in many countries, uh, most of the population in Asia Pacific is still rural. So this is uh, what we should think about, thinking about these policies, especially on inequality, and uh, not stay focused on the cities we usually live in and just, just just keep it high on the agenda. And coming back to the last points on what the fiscal policies and their impact on inequality. So, we took a look on the research done by the Commitment, on, uh, Commitment to Equity Institute and uh, looked how fiscal policies impact uh, inequalities. So uh, on the y-axis, uh, uh, you have categories of fiscal expenditure and uh, revenue by the government, from education, direct transfers, health, to taxes. Dots uh, are countries. Uh, and the dashes boxes are countries in Asia Pacific for where we had the data. On the Y axis are Gini points on scale 1 to 100. And this graph shows the total impact of fiscal policies as per 1% of GDP, either expenditure or revenue for taxes. So looking at category one, the bottom dot, for example, uh, shows that there was a country where for 1% of GDP spent on education, they achieved 1% of Gini reduction. This is a total one of reduction. This is not yearly reduction. So this is comparison of situation, what would happen with and without these policies. But for some countries uh, spending the same amount of 1% of GDP, uh, they have, for example, half or zero points uh, Gini change. So there is less or no impact on inequality. And the same is true from other categories, two, three, four, and uh, also for the tax categories. So some taxes uh, either decrease inequalities or some increase, but also there is a large variation in how they do this. So we might have direct taxes, which indeed change inequalities as we hoped for, but for some countries they don't. And the same is for VAT and uh, the other taxes. So this tells us that even if policies fall under the same category and countries spend a lot of money on them, they have very, very different impact on inequality and that do not necessarily deliver the expected results to the extent we want. So here comes uh, the conclusion and questions we would like to ask in this uh, the discussion. How to redesign the fiscal policies to indeed reduce inequalities, so have the largest impact possible? Uh, what fiscal expenditures should be prioritized as we have very limited fiscal space. How to increase fiscal revenues uh, if possible, but keeping also in mind that we cannot harm the economy. And how to improve the already existing fiscal policy efficiency and also of those who will be implementing just to stop wasting the resources and to get the most uh, impact we can possibly have with the resources we have. So um, that's all and 
from now on, uh, we would like to listen to our uh, participants. So I'll give the voice back to Hamza. Excellent, Mihal. Very succinct, but to the point and raising extremely pertinent questions. Um, the situation, as you very clearly showed, is not that simple and not that straightforward. We all talk about fiscal policy measures and assume once the governments will introduce them, it will have the desired impact, but they don't. And now of this special situation that COVID has created, of course, the questions have become all the more pertinent. So let me turn to our uh, distinguished speakers. First up, we have Ms. Christina Duarte, currently serving as Under Secretary General and Special Advisor on Africa to the United Nations Secretary General. Ms. Duarte actually has already served, uh, has uh, served as a Minister of Finance and Planning in the Republic of um, Cape Verde from 2006 to 2016. She has an extensive experience of 34 years of leadership and strategic management in and in public policy making and also in the private sector. Ms. Duarte, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, um, Asla. Uh, I would like to ask Michael if he, he could uh, uh, thank Um First, uh, I think uh, some of you are asking what a, a small a, a small island African country coming from West Africa is doing in this uh, this uh, EGM in Asia is a long uh, is a long way. Uh, the reason uh, I make myself available uh, to participate in this EGM and I, I'll do I do with a, with a great pleasure. Is because Cape Verde, being a small country, has been played, at least in Africa, a sort of lab, lab camp, lab camp. And this is the reason that I, I saw that it, uh, it might be interesting um, telling, uh, telling this story. Second, um, of course, I'm going to uh, present a case study, Cape Verde case study from, uh, from 2001, 2016. This is the period, and more essentially from 2006 to 2000, uh, 2016. Uh, and uh, from 2006 to 2016, uh, everybody knows that uh, uh, countries in the world, they had to face uh, uh, the subprime international, the subprime international crisis and uh, that crisis it gave birth in a quite uh, in a quite bad uh, bad way. Following slide, Michael. So um, I'm convinced uh, that one of the best ways to assess the political will to deliver sustainable development is just go to the spending side of the budget after implementation on the not the proposal that the parliament approves, but the, the effective spending side of the budget. And you can assess if indeed a specific government has political will or not to deliver uh, to deliver a sustainable development. Because as everybody knows, I believe in this meeting, uh, fiscal policy play, plays a huge role uh, in terms of uh, delivering sustainable uh, sustainable development. So the structure of the taxes, as well as the structure of the spending, uh, 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 often um, they have as a central a central role. And this is the challenge, because doing nothing, doing nothing in terms of changing the tax structure or changing the spending structure to address inequality or poverty, so doing nothing, usually translated, usually translates in a pro-rich bias economic growth. And in Africa, at least, there is, Africa is plenty of examples of, of, of this. So to avoid such bias, um, uh, income earning potential should ensure that vulnerable people also share in the food. Or in other words, uh, based on Cape Verde experience, it is not possible to deliver sustainable development if you are not able to associate economic growth with income distribution. And of course, this requires people-centered policies. And this is, I believe, even 
a, a quite appropriate statement, Africa after COVID-19. COVID a third slide, please. Uh, so, uh, let me give you, uh, in a very quick way, a picture of what happened in Cape Verde. Very quickly. 75 uh, is uh, when we start our journey. And Cape Verde in 75 was no nation, no state, no, new, no human capital. In 1947, 30% of the population died of due to famines. Only 10% of land uh, is suitable for, agri uh, for agriculture out of 4,000 square meters, so no land at all, no resources, no water, no market, zero infrastructure, infrastructure and I could keep this list on. This was our picture in 75. In 2008, Cape Verde has been graduated to a middle-income country. The first in Africa to be graduated to a middle-income country without commodities. A per capita income increase from 190 to 3,800. Poverty has been reduced from 49 to 24. Literacy reached 95% coverage rates. In 2012, we have been uh, considered the fifth African country from an infrastructure development standpoint, and the top 10 FDI destinations, and uh, the sixth in e-governance, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, next slide, Michael, please. Uh, so basically, this is the story that I will try to, to, to tell you in, uh, in a very summarized way. And the role played by fiscal policy to deliver this, because it played a central role. And I'm going to touch basically in five, uh, let's say five items or five axes. First, get control of, of your treasury net, short term liquidity, otherwise, you are stuck. Second, start for qualifying your expenses. Third, then consolidation of your revenues, force endogenous debt restructuring, and I then I will try to explain this. And the fifth, efficient deficit uh, financing. Of course, but more important, I have I need to tell you, uh, in the case of Cape Verde, basically we made pragmatic pragmatic and realistic our plan. We avoid popular, populist, populist measures and uh, with a strong uh, political will. So next slide, please. So the first is get control of your state treasury. So to address, so you just freeze your liquidity risk. That was my first step, let's say, as Minister of Finance. What I did? I basically uh, proceed to a bankerization of, straight, of state treasury because the situation was a quite funny one. Uh, um, I realized that I was uh, issuing, of course, short-term bonds to finance my, my short-term liquidity with the treasury liquidity and paying interest on my money. So, because the uh, treasury uh, liquidity was in the banking system and I was issuing uh, short-term treasury bonds, banks were buying my bonds, let's say in this way, with my money, and then I was paying interest to them. So, that was my first measure, get control of state treasury and short-term uh, short liquidity. Of course, the only way to get that in a very short period of time was by leveraging in a quite heavy way digitization. And basically we digitize all our treasury ma management. Next slide, please. Second, of course, I look at the expenditure side of the budget because I believe that uh, trying to improve the revenue side of the budget where your expenditure side of the budget is essentially a basket full of holes is quite dangerous. So uh, my uh, second, after I tackled the treasury title, the treasury dimension, short-term liquidity, so I, as I used to say, so I could sleep and have money to pay salaries, let's say in this way, I went to the expenditure side of the budget, of course, due to higher elasticity. 
basically um, a couple of measures. First, cut budget oil subsidies. And these uh, provide me a huge fiscal space, a huge fiscal. Uh, so I align oil domestic price with international one. Second, I cancel a price compensation mechanism under a privatization scheme of the power company. It's a little bit complicated to, 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 to explain, but basically the uh, Cape, Verde, Cape Verde Treasury were paying a quite huge amount of money to a company that has bought our, our power, uh, a foreign company that has bought that has bought our public power company uh, because in the privatization process they pay a much higher price much above the market price and the premium was negotiated on the backstage to reimburse after after the buying of course uh, i canceled this price compensation mechanism third uh, was the complete rationalization of the tax uh, the tax incentive system. Before, tax incentives were uh, basically completely pro proliferated for more than a, uh, for more than a decade, and managed managed more on an ad hoc basis. And I need to be very open on ad hoc and vested interest basis. Vested interest basis. So undermining undermining the tax base and creating distortions in the functioning of the market. Basically, what we did, we basically changed the paradigm of the tax incentive system. Instead of um, uh, giving incentives to sectors, we link incentives to macroeconomic goals. If someone generates jobs, generates uh, savings, uh, generates um, uh, economic diversification, etc., is entitled to incentives. Doesn't matter if it's a big, small, medium, uh, or medium company. The, the, believe me, the family company that takes a small, um, a micro credit uh, loan and manage to generate five uh, jobs can get incentives in in, in Cape Verde. So we democratize basically the tax incentive system in Cape Verde. And of course, we restructure VAT. VAT is, uh, is uh, from a fiscal standpoint, uh, it can leverage a lot uh, in terms of creating fiscal space. What we did, basically, we abolished reduced tax because v VAT, uh, if you succeed in having fewer taxes, not to say one, is the best one. Cape Verde, after creating VAT, they kept just changing. The, or creating reduced taxes, higher taxes. At the end of the day, basically, they almost jeopardize the efficiency of the, this type of, of taxes. So we abolish reduced rates. And what happened? We, 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 from a compliance gap standpoint, as you see in that chart, uh, it, it, it decreased. It decreased the, 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 the compliance gap decreased from 2013 when we took the when we took action decreased uh, because we did that uh, because we abolished uh, reduced rate. Next uh, slide, please. Of course, by doing so, um, the fiscal space was created, which was was used to fight monetary poverty first. Money. So this additional fiscal space we channel to fight monetary and non-monetary poverty. Monetary poverty, what we did very quickly, we increased the social pension 285%. We enlarge and consolidate the social protection system. Now Cape Verde as a, is a reference in Africa from a social protection system. So we increase by 100% the non contributive uh, system and we universalize the contributive one to all public administration, central and local, to all family members, householders, small order farmers, addresses, small, medium, uh, medium enterprise and go on. Education, we increase in a very sharp way scholarships, school transportation, school feeding and school kids. 
And in the middle of the crisis, that was, a, uh, as I used to say, a World Food Programme gift. In the middle of the crisis, World Food Programme withdraws from school feeding in Cape. And thanks to and thanks to the fiscal space created by cutting oil subsidies, uh, by cancelling price price uh, price uh, compensation mechanisms, so all this fiscal space, I was in a position that the World Food Program left school feeding program today, and the, the national budget took over in the following day. So took over in the following day. So we were able to maintain school feeding. School feeding in Cape Verde play a crucial role for Cape Verde to deliver MDGs, most of the MDGs, most of the MDGs. Uh, uh, following slide, please. And of course, we use the fiscal space to fight non-monetary poverty through a strong infrastructure program. What are the results? Four international airports, nine maritime ports, two deep water, two Atlantic cables, and all islands connected. We, we reach a 95% coverage rate from energy standpoint. And of course, Cape Verde is a as adopt e governance because it's only is the only way to deliver accountability transparency and to fight and to fight uh, and to fight corruption next slide please the third x was of course the revenue side of the budget as a lower elasticity as everybody uh, knows basically what we did uh, we helped companies firms the private sector to cope with, with international crisis. We, decre we decreased corporate tax from 35 to 25 percent. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, for uh, small, uh, I would say for medium companies from 20 to 50 percent. We decreased income tax from 45 percent to 35 percent highest bracket, from 15 percent to 11 percent lowest bracket. bracket. We create a special regime, a special regime for micro and small enterprise, uh, which are 80% of the companies in Cape Verde. What we did, we create a single rate, 4%. Simplifying, small and uh, micro and small uh, enterprise, they pay only 4%. And this 4% single rate is a is a merger of 5% of VAT, 15% of income taxes and 15% to, uh, to the social security. We compound in a one single rate of 4%. Of course, and we digitize the National Revenue Authority essentially to fight corruption, which was already low in Cape Verde, but we have no space for corruption. In Cape Verde, corruption needs to be zero tolerance. Uh, next slide, please. Four axes was the endogenous debt restructuring. So basically, the first step was to replace bad debt with good debt. Um, uh, so debt was around public debt to GDP was around 75%, but essentially financing uh, mainly um, uh, current expenditures. So basically, the first step was to decrease public debt from 75% to 57%, and that was uh, from 2005 uh, until 2008. 2008, as everybody knows, the international price hit Cape Verde. Fortunately, I managed to decrease the debt before. And from 2009, um, uh, I, uh, I started increasing public debt. It was already planned before the 2008 crisis, because as I told you, the idea was to replace bad debt for good debt. So I start increasing. So at the same time, uh, so I create fiscal, in this case, debt space to infrastructure uh, the country. And by doing so, at the end of the day, uh, the, the, the public investment uh, basically became a quite counter cycle uh, price response. Second, I replace domestic debt for external debt is, is quite obvious because uh, Cape Verde as a, as a, is under a peg system to the euro, and under a peg system uh, to the euro, you need to maintain your domestic debt uh, uh, in the low side, uh, in the low side. And of course, third, 
uh, by doing so, we release budget resources for for investment. So revenues, uh, uh, we manage to to generate uh, a current primary balance positive, and these, of course, release resources for public investments and to mobilize and to mobilize uh, external uh, external finance. As you can see, uh, uh, the deficit increased as well as the debt. And that was a very difficult time for Cape Verde to convince the world. Can you imagine? I'm trying to convince IMF and the World Bank that this is the way to go uh, uh, in the case of, 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 of Cape Verde. And I will explain when we go to the financing of the debt. Uh, um, the blue line, as you can see, is the, is the debt. And the red line is the debt. And that deficit that is going deeper and deeper, of course, in negative terms. Behind that, behind that deficit, I can assure you, is only infrastructure, only infrastructure. Remember the four international airports, the nine maritime ports, and etc. The, uh, the, thick, the fifth X is the efficient deficit financing. Basically, what we did. Um, uh, because Cape Verde is a quite, a quite micro country, we managed to mobilize uh, concessional financing. Actually, I spent 10 years refusing commercial, uh, commercial banking finance because we, were, we didn't have space to accommodate commercial, commercial banking financing. And what we, the result in terms of efficient deficit finance basically is a, ma a maturity of over 25 years, so much higher than the the, the today's euro bonds that have been issued by some African countries, a, a great period of seven to 10 years, an average interest rate of 1.4%, 95% of the debt is on fixed interest rates and 3.9% on floating interest rates. 53% uh, of our debt was in the eurozone. And this is important because we have we are back to the, uh, to the, to the, to the euro. So the structure of our external debt is important. So 98% official official credit. So I'm talking, of course, about that period. Next slide, please. So basically, our debt strategy was um, in order to take an opportunity of the, the graduation of Cape Verde from least developed country to a middle income country, because basically the international community told us. Uh, we are going to graduate you. We are going to graduate you. You have a five to eight year window to keep enjoying concessional finance. After that window, the concessional financial is over. And we, you are back. You need to get additional financing um, through market conditions. Basically, what we did, we tried to grab the opportunity in terms of mobilizing cheap money to infrastructure at a low cost uh, Cape Verde, but at the same time, trying to maintain, let's say, uh, macroeconomic, macroeconomic stability. This is the reason that Cape Verde has a high stock, and when I left was, if I'm not mistaken, 113%, but reasonable flows. And here, you have debt service to fiscal revenues, and debt service to export revenues. People ask me how come Cape Verde managed to combine high stock with reasonable flows. We just accept cheap money. We just accept cheap, uh, cheap money. Next slide. What are the results? Uh, basically, uh, I think we can move to the next slide, Michael, the graph slide. So the impact on poverty reduction and inequality. In the first figure, the dark blue line is Cape Verde, and this is GN, GNI per capita. You can see the dark blue line just go up, just goes up. The life expectancy, so no, the known monetary uh, poverty. So Cape Verde, despite being a lower middle income country, is at the level of upper middle income country. Next slide, please. And here you have, uh, I believe, in a very clear way, the results. The first chart indicates how extreme poverty and general poverty decrease. Um, the non-monetary poverty uh, uh, is a uh, chart three. 
the light blue line is our position in 2000. So in terms of water, um, uh, uh, child mortality, maternity mortality, etc., etc., and the dark blue line is uh, how the situation was much improved in 2015. So they, there is a huge difference between the light, the light uh, blue line and the dark blue line, and this is exactly how we deliver uh, the site, let's say, from a non-monetary poverty uh, standard. So stand Basically, uh, I believe the lesson from this lab country is to fight inequalities. Um, you need to uh, to deliver uh, persistency and consistency from a policy making. There are no magics. There are no magics. You just keep doing, doing and doing. And of course, in order to be persistent and consistent, uh, only with a political, a strong political will a strong political will in terms of adopting a people's center. Thank you. Thank you very much. I hope I didn't take too much time. And well, thank you, Ms. Duarte. It was a treat um, to listen to a case study. Nothing beats a good case study. I mean, we can hear all sorts of theory, look at all sorts of data, hypothetical uh, impact of policies and so on and so forth in scenarios, but nothing beats the actual case of a country. Uh, delivered by a finance minister and showing how the transition has actually taken place. It's and the evidence is there. The taste is in the pudding. You actually concluded that all the changes that you introduced around the five axis policies did have an impact at the end of the day. I gather that you have to leave. So if I may take the liberty of asking a few questions. My, my, my colleague, the, the, the actual minister of finance in Cape Verde, he is in the same situation I was in 2006 after COVID-19 crisis. So I, I hope that you will be in a position to adopt the same the same path. Uh, yes, I need to leave because uh, it's already uh, 20 to 9 in New York. But if there is any question, um, if not, I would like uh, to thank and to leave. But if there is any question, any clarification. Uh, just one or two questions, if you have time for yes. like three, four minutes. Yes, yeah, because yes. one key question we we, we really uh, going to discuss in the rest of the discussion also. Um, what is, I mean, this nexus between fiscal policy and inequality and impact of fiscal policy and poverty and these kind of issues are very old issues. They have been discussed, you know, for decades. What is the new element in your experience, in your view, that the COVID-19 has brought to this debate? What is the new angle in the context of COVID that you think is worth paying attention to as countries endeavor on fiscal policies, for instance, on the lines of five axes that you have shared? And is there anything new or is just like you concluded already, consistency and persistence matters quite a bit. Uh, but is there any, any new insights from you in the COVID context? I do believe that each crisis has its own specificities and we cannot just uh, replicate what I, uh, at that time, I managed to deliver as Minister of Finance to cope with the 2008 subprime international crisis, uh, we cannot, of course, just uh, to replicate. But allow me that I, I, I strongly believe that uh, values and principles, and I'm going to do something that I'm going to provide a non-technical response, allow me. I strongly believe that at the end of the day, values and principles when delivering policy making does do make a difference. It's not only about technicalities, it's not about only, only about tax rates, it's not only about uh, edging uh, uh, derivatives, etc. At the end of the day, values and principles play an important, an important role. This is the reason that I have been advocating in this my new position that the only way after Africa can recover forward better is by adopting finally people center policy making. Uh, Africa, I will give you an, I will not mention the African country. For each $10 spent on education, only 
reach the beneficiaries. We are not going to recover better with this type of situation. So uh, this is what I would like to, from a technical, from a technical standpoint. Uh, uh, in the, again, I bring uh, I bring here Africa situation because this is the, the situation that I know better. African countries they are chasing fiscal space, basically they are chasing, but this is a paradox because the same Africa, the same continent, loses 89 billion dollars in illicit financial flows. Yeah. So. In our, with our right hand, we beg for money, and with our left hand, we just lose $89 billion in illicit, in illicit financial flows. So I just defend in a meeting this afternoon uh, with the African Union that to recover forward better, of course, SDRs will play a role, but are not the solution, are part of the solution, but are not the solution. African countries need to put in the driver's seat domestic resource mobilization. Definitely. Is the only way to get fiscal space and by getting fiscal space to get policy space. This is the two issues that I'd like to mention very quickly. No, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ate. This is this is actually quite relevant and resonates with what we heard yesterday in our uh, keynote speech by Minou Shafiq. Uh, we were talking about the issue of building trust, actually, when we try and build economies. And your point on values and principles, it, in my understanding, falls in the same domain. So in addition to technicalities, we need to pay attention to issues of how to increase trust of the public in governments, for instance, in delivering. And that comes from following values and principles, as you were highlighting. Um, let me ask my panelists here, uh, uh, Jonathan, Sally, um, uh, Sangyop, if you want to ask any question to Ms. Duarte, any one of you want to ask because she has to go and she made an extremely direct and clear case study. You have any questions for her or you can continue? Oh, I enjoyed the presentation. I have no questions. <laughs> Excellent. So thank you, Ms. Wade, once again. Thank this is you, you, very you, useful for our work. Uh, yeah. We'll try and certainly thank highlight these messages. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. Bye. Thank Bye. you so much. Thank you. Bye. <clears throat> thank you, Ms. Wade. OK, so continuing. This was a very, very excellent scene setting, actual case study. Now let's turn to our next speaker, Ms. Mr. Jonathan Ostry is a very well known uh, actually name in academic circles, in policy circles for quite some time. I've learned a lot from your readings, by the way. So you've been writing very pertinent uh, 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 papers on the subject. You're currently serving as the Deputy Director of Asia and the Pacific Department at the IMF. Um, you've written a lot of number of books on international macro policy issues and numerous articles in various journals. So your work on inequality and understanding unsustainable growth actually has recently been cited by Barack Obama as well. So your voice is reaching out to very, very important and pertinent people. So Jonathan would love to hear what you have to say today on the subject. Over to you. Thanks very much, Hamza. Let me let me share my screen. Okay, good. Well, I, I'd like to uh, thank you and Escat for, for inviting me. Thank you to Suida and Hamza and Mikhail for organizing all this. Um, I'm going to uh, step back from this issue uh, a little bit. So we're moving from the very granular case study that we just heard about to some, some basic empirical research on the relationship between uh, pandemics, inequality, and what fiscal policy uh, can do to um, to alleviate the inequality uh, consequences of, of pandemics. Um, I'm going to draw on a couple of sources. I'm going to draw um, on uh, a recent book of mine on uh, inequality, which predates the, the pandemic. Uh, and it, it, it has uh, quite a lot of material on the role of fiscal policy in both um, creating the problem and alleviating the problem. 
Uh, and it's also going to draw on some recent papers um, on the inequality effects of pandemics that are uh, published in uh, different series from the CPR. Um, you know, when when we started this research, uh, you know, it was right at the beginning of the <laughs> pandemic, and um, a lot of, you know, there wasn't really much known about how the pandemic was going to uh, affect uh, vulnerable people versus rich people. Uh, those with low skills, uh, women, youth, uh, informal workers. Um, but so what we decided to do, since I, I think policymakers were hungry for uh, for answers to these questions, is we wanted to look at the uh, impact uh, on inequality <laughs> of past pandemics. Um, and we didn't want to go um, uh, a long way back in history because we wanted to be able to sort of have uh, some lessons that that were relevant to to, to today's um, institutional uh, settings in 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 the world. Um, you you may some of you may know that there is a, a literature that studies the impact of of pandemics uh, from hundreds of years ago, um, and that comes to very different um, uh, uh, conclusions uh, to the ones that I'm going to be presenting today. Uh, the most famous. Uh, uh, studies is Walter Scheidel's famous book uh, called The Great Leveler, where he found that um, Black Death that occurred um, uh, you know, hundreds of years ago um, actually um, uh, was, was uh, you know, something that, that created more equality in society. And it did so in a horrible way uh, in that uh, so many people um, uh, died uh, because medicine and science were not what they are uh, today. Um, and as a result, um, unskilled labor became uh, much more scarce. And so, um, and so, uh, you know, unskilled workers, uh, the wages of unskilled workers actually rose. But that's not what we have seen today. And it is not what we saw uh, in the aftermath of the different uh, pandemics that we have seen uh, this century. And it is those that I'm going to be uh, studying in, in, this, um, in this next few minutes. Um, and then I'm going to turn in the last part of my presentation to see what role fiscal policy can play uh, in uh, in alleviating um, uh, some of these uh, untoward consequences of pandemics. Just to set the stage, what what are the events that I'm going to be talking about? Well, they're listed here, uh, and they'll be familiar to uh, to all of you in this virtual room. Uh, and they differ in terms of, um, you know, their geographical um, uh, impact, uh, their uh, their health impact in terms of deaths and cases, um, and how broadly they spread uh, throughout the globe. Um, some are confined to a region; uh, others are uh, are more global in nature. And and these are all uh, the D WHO sanctioned. Uh, uh, pandemics of this century, and they're going to form uh, the data that we uh, that we use uh, in this study. And I'm going to be um, looking at at two definitions of a pandemic. One is is going to be simply a dummy variable when the WHO declares uh, a country has been affected by a particular pandemic. Uh, but of course, pandemics also differ um, in in their severity in terms of cases through the population, and there's uh, there's going to be an alternative definition that I'm that I'm going to um, that I'm going to also deal with in terms of uh, number of, of cases. Uh, I'm going to focus mostly on the first, but you'll see it in various parts. I'll switch to the second. Um, uh, the story is is very much of a piece uh, in either definition. And I'm I'm not going to be terribly innovative um, uh, in terms of the methodology that I'm going to use to study these events. Uh, I'm going to use uh, Oscar Jordan's famous uh, local projection method uh, to um, to see uh, you know what the the consequences on some uh, dependent depend variable, typically uh, a measure of inequality, um, um, you know, following the the onset of a pandemic. Um, if you look at the first equation, basically, I'm going to be the, the you know the dependent variable is a measure of inequality. It could be a genie. It could be uh, top or bottom income shares. It could be some some something to do with the labor market, such as um, uh, you know jobs uh, look you know, jobs for low skilled folks uh, relative to total jobs available and so forth. Um, and the, the the 
the dummy uh, variable D is the is the pandemic. Um, and then there are um, a bunch of controls. Uh, uh, the X's are going to consist at, at a minimum of a couple lags of the dependent variable and of the pandemic uh, dummy. But we'll we'll consider in robustness uh, checks a whole bunch of additional controls and they're going to be time and country effects in the model to to uh, to capture um, uh, either country specific effects or global factors that might drive um, um, such as a global business cycle that might drive the uh, the dependent variable. And I'm going to simply be looking at the impulse responses uh, that uh, that come straight from these local protection um, uh, regressions. Um, and so let, let's uh, get straight to it. Um, first of all, not focusing on uh, on uh, a distributional variable, but but on an aggregate variable to begin with. Uh, pandemics uh, tend to to make economies poorer. Um, and it's interesting to me that it's it's not something that's um, that's uh, short lived. Uh, these are the impulse responses um, in the blue and the uh, uh, the confidence bands uh, that are shaded. Um, and and it's something that that uh, that persists. Um, and it, that's true either for the uh, the dummy variable version of the pandemic or uh, or the case uh, the caseload version. And it's something that's that's persistent. So um, uh, pandemics make economies poorer. But they they do so in an in an in a sort of non homogeneous way, and here's where the distribution variables uh, come in. Um, here is uh, the impulse response for the net genie, so the post tax and transfer uh, genie. Again, blue is is the impulse response, and the and the shaded um, area um, are the uh, confidence bands. And again, here what you see is um, that inequality rises in the aftermath of the pandemic. So um, those at the top um, do not suffer to the same degree uh, as those at the bottom. Um, and again, to emphasize, this is not something that is a blip. It is not something that um, happens and then goes away in a year. It is something uh, that 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 sticks around for a while. And these are these these there are five years plotted here, and it actually is worse longer term than it is uh, short term. And that's something we have to think about. Um, I'm not sure I have. Uh, an answer. It may be that what was on the previous slide in terms of what it does to the economy as a whole is part of the answer, but it's clearly not uh, not the whole story. Um, it, it, it may have to do with, uh, the, you know, different opportunities, even even, you know, two, three, four years out for those at the bottom. But it certainly seems to be in the data that these inequality effects are 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 not short lived. They they are persistent. Um, some people at, you know, much of this paper, because it's an academic paper, um, is focused on robustness. Can we trust the results? Are the results, um, a, 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 you know, a function of the particular data that is used? Are they a function of the particular method of that is used? Are they a function of, um, you know, which variables are controls in this model, et cetera, et cetera? And while this is an academic conference, and I'm not going to go through the the voluminous robustness checks. Let me just state here, and I refer you to the paper itself, that the, these results tend to be extremely robust. It's very difficult to, to overturn them with, with any of the data or methods that, that we are aware of. Um, this is an alternative method that was used, for example, by Romer and Romer uh, in their AER paper, this autoregressive distributed lag, so not the Jordan um, uh, local projection method. And again, you get a very similar result that, that inequality rises in a persistent fashion uh, in the aftermath of, of pandemics. Um, you know, some people um, uh, will will worry about uh, about endogeneity, the fact that, um, you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, the, 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 the severity of the pandemics itself, not something that is exogenous. It depends on certain country characteristics. Uh, more unequal societies may simply have um, uh, uh, you know, more severe pandemics. And what we want to get is the causality um, um, that is running from the pandemic to uh, to inequality, not the other way around. And so one way that, that economists um, uh, find convenient to to investigate sort of um, the, the causality that runs in one direction rather than the other is to use an instrumental variable approach and a convenient instrumental variable that we can use here uh, is the interaction between a global variable, 
like uh, the WHO declaration with some country specific variable. And here, uh, temperature turns out to be, average temperature turns out to be a, a very good uh, country specific variable because there's a lot of uh, data that suggests that temperature um, is an important mediating factor for the severity of pandemics. And again, here in the blue, we have the OLS that we had from uh, before, and the instrumental variable is the is the uh, red uh, solid line in the middle, and then the, the shaded areas the, are the confidence bands. And again, the story with the uh, with the instrumental variable is is very much of a piece, but it is actually much stronger than the OLS. Notice that the the instrumental variable results are on the right scale, which is a, a completely different scale um, than the left scale. And so the inequality effects are actually uh, much stronger um, uh, when you use the instrumental variable rather than uh, the OLS approach. Uh, Jonathan, five, min five minutes. Well, yeah, sure. Uh, I'm, I'm happy to wrap up in, in five minutes very easily. Thank you. Um, uh, another um, uh, thing we might uh, worry about is um, you know, again, in the so that was for the for the continuous variable. Um, there's also another way of of uh, you know getting at uh, uh, sort of the endogeneity issue with the with the discrete variable, which is uh, which is due to Jordan and Taylor, which essentially involves um, reweighting uh, the observations to uh, get uh, higher weights on those with, um, that are more likely to be uh, exogenous and more. Difficult. And again, what we find is that the, the results are very robust. Um, and, and finally, one of the things we want to know is whether um, the sort of the, uh, the trends in the, uh, the underlying distributional variables are the same in the, uh, in the treatment uh, variables, those that have experienced the shock versus the control variables. And, um, and so one of the ways you do this is run a placebo test and again, what we find is that we can't reject uh, the the uh, hypothesis that the uh, trends in the in the treatment and control variables are the same. Um, so, what is really going on? Uh, why is inequality rising? Well, there are some mediating factors that we can look at, and we can look at alternative uh, uh, distributional uh, measures. And here, what we look at is um, uh, you know income deciles, uh, income quintiles, and we find that those at the uh, at the top. Uh, tend to see their income shares rise in the aftermath of pandemics, and those at the bottom tend to see their income shares fall in the aftermath of pandemics. So that may be one factor that is driving the inequality measures. Uh, the other is uh, relates to the labor market, um, and here what we see is that um, those with good good skills um, versus those with uh, only basic skills, um, those with basic skills uh, tend to see a uh, very permanent persistent job losses in the aftermath of pandemic. So this is uh, one factor again that may uh, also underlie the, the results for the GD. Um, we also see that um, informality tends to uh, rise, whether informality uh, as a share of the total economy or, inform uh, or informality as a share of total employment, uh, these tend to rise in the aftermath of pandemic. Um, some people want to know whether pandemics are different from plain vanilla recessions or financial crises, crises and indeed that is what we find. Um, the, the impacts on inequality uh, from pandemics are much larger and more persistent than those that follow from uh, plain vanilla recessions or financial crises. Um, some people want to know whether uh, the severity of, uh, of the pandemic it itself has an impact on inequality. And indeed, that is what we find. Uh, pandemics like, uh, like COVID, which are uh, sort of at the 99th percentile, of the, uh, would be at the 99th percentile of, uh, in terms of severity of the pandemics in our sample, they will tend to have much more severe impacts on inequality and on, uh, uh, on average growth than uh, your, your typical pandemic in our uh, 21st century sample. So let me turn to the last part, which is on the role of fiscal policy. Um, what we all know and what we, what we uh, saw in, uh, in Mikhail's uh, nice presentation at the beginning, uh, which is that um, uh, you know, um, pandemics are costly for the budget and for debt. Uh, fiscal, fiscal balances tend to deteriorate in the aftermath of pandemics and public debt tends to rise. Um, but what we want to know is whether um, staying the course on fiscal policy is actually helpful 
uh, in terms of alleviating the inequality consequences of uh, pandemics. And what we uh, what we do is we um, we augment our basic model that I gave you in the first uh, couple slides by interacting uh, the pandemic with uh, uh, some variable that measures um, that measures fiscal policy. Uh, and this um, this interaction is going to tell us whether uh, at the end of the day, um, uh, fiscal policy can help uh, alleviate the problem that the pandemic has created. And all of the variables, the fiscal variables that we are going to be using are cyclically adjusted. So we're going to be getting at sort of the impact of discretionary fiscal policy rather than the impact of the cycle itself. Uh, and what we find is that really, um, uh, you know, the inequality, the untoward inequality impacts of pandemics are something that fiscal policy can address. Um, uh, and what we what we see in these two panels is um, what happens when fiscal policy is relatively austere, as on the left, or fiscal policy is uh, whatever the opposite of austere uh, is generous on the right. And what we can see is that on the right, when fiscal policy uh, avoids a premature return to austerity, uh, the inequality uh, uh, effects of pandemics can be largely undone. Um, as we see in the blue line, which where the confidence bands uh, straddle zero. Um, and this is true whether we use as a measure of fiscal um, uh, the deficit, uh, which is what I have on this picture, or uh, health expenditure, which is a very important component of fiscal policy uh, in, uh, in, the, in these times. Um, so let me just conclude. Uh, 21st century pandemics have led to persistent increases uh, in the Gini. Uh, past pandemics have raised the income share of higher income deciles and lowered the employment to population ratio for those with basic education compared to those with higher education. The impact of past pandemics on inequality has been greater in the more severe episodes. This augurs poorly for, co for COVID-19's impact. Austerity breeds K-shaped recoveries, the rise in inequality when fiscal policy is tighter. While when the when the fiscal response is supportive, inequality barely increases. Key is for fiscal policy to be supportive supportive for the long haul. Thank you. Excellent uh, presentation, Jonathan. Thank you so much for showing a very very strong data rich evidence. Actually, the pandemics worsens inequality, and the countries our policymakers are in it for a long haul, and so they need to remain focused. The message, uh, fundamental message that you shared in the end echoes extremely well with our messaging that we have been putting out there and discussing with member states. Austerity is not an option in this current context and they need to continue to remain to, to continue to support uh, countries through the fiscal policy measures. But then there's a debate on uh, can every country afford that kind of thing and for how long and what are the consequences, but that is beyond the scope of your presentation. Thank you so much. Let me now turn to our next uh, speaker, Professor Seng Hyop Lee. Uh, who is currently the professor and chair in the Department of Economics at the University of Hawaii at Manao and East West Center. Uh, professor Lee, the floor is yours. OK, thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Oh, OK, so can you see my presentation? Yes. Oh, OK, so. Uh, uh, I mean, I, let me begin with just the overall consideration, a big picture and the post target group and effectiveness and whether this is sustainable. And I'm not actually a public finance person. I'm not a macro simulator in, you know, person. I'm a population economist. Uh, and especially we actually developed uh, some data sets, so-called national transfer accounts. So let me actually uh, use that data and to see, show uh, some of the results we got. Okay. So we talked about this holistic approach, but my holistic approach has a different meaning. The holistic means actually where the inequality stems from, right? So, I mean, it's uh, many countries, I mean, countries are different, but uh, some countries, especially in developing Asia, has a segmented labor market problem. And some people actually can work in a formal sector, some people actually work in informal sector, self-employed, and the use of unemployment is uh, such a big problem. And then uh, the rising cost of uh, children, I mean, especially because of the rising private schooling, I mean, the tuition is actually a big issue. And some families actually support them and uh, they actually end up with like, uh, you know, falling in poverty trap or when they get old because the pension system is now well developed and the housing price is rising. So the inequality comes from either labor or capital. And then uh, the, the household debt is actually also a problem because they borrow the money to buy a house. And then uh, 
there is a uh, little social protection for many developing Asian countries. So, so this is actually, I mean, when I talked about the holistic approach, this is not really, I mean, the fiscal policy, I mean, in terms of narrow meaning. Uh, so these are more holistic approaches, really big picture, right? So this, these gears are very closely linked to each other. That's why probably it's very difficult to reduce inequality because there's many different sources. And COVID-19 has brought to huge challenges, of course, and all countries are different. Uh, it, it takes only one minute, okay? Let me show you some big picture. What is big picture? Uh, suppose you are working and you are not working. I mean, if you are not working, how can you support your consumption? In 10,000 years ago, only family, right? Because there is no uh, financial sector, there is no banking system, there is no government, right? 10,000 years ago. So some countries moved this way. Oh, the government doesn't do anything and they just rely on uh, their asset or saving. And some countries move to this way. I mean, they totally, I mean, the government take care of uh, like paying, using pension system, public health care system. So I would call it social welfare transformation. And this is like a capital based transformation. So based on our data set, we actually checked how, whether the people are actually relying on. And then uh, the European countries are on the right hand side and Japan, US. US is more actually saving based. I mean, they, they, you know, your like replacement rate at pension system is, uh, is not as high as Europe. And the Thailand actually after 1997, they were like a developing Asia, they are moving to this way. So it's like an inverse U shape. They started from here and moving here and uh, moving down here. So this is like Korea time. So why I drew this kind of picture? Because of, there are many policy options. One is uh, and people, I mean, the fiscal policy and government policy can actually still encourage people to uh, work. So support to work. And uh, right now, uh, a lot of money was spent on that, actually. Right? It's appropriate and inevitable. But actually, um, it's not sufficient. There are not many sufficient available jobs. So in many countries uh, in developing Asia, uh, they actually in, use uh, this money to increase uh, uh, some temporary jobs or government sector jobs, which is not decent job. So this is really a band-aid actually solution. Uh, and the labor market actually structure doesn't allow the sustainable policy on encouraging actually work. I mean, it's hard to actually imagine including family transfer, right? So because, uh, I mean, I, I believe actually Singapore is the only country who spend money to, to give a huge incentive so that means actually they provide a huge incentive and tax incentive and fiscal incentive if they actually live together, if the, the you know, grown children live together with their elderly and they take care of them. So, but it's not made, it's not sustainable because of women's level of force participation rising, declining fertility and pandemic. So uh, that's probably, a, I mean, has all limitations. So increased public transfers. This is actually a fiscal policy in terms of, you know, narrow meaning. So it's inevitable, right? Because of rising inequality and poverty and COVID-19. Uh, you can actually uh, invest in public health and education for, uh, uh, for poor group, which may reduce inequality for a long time. Uh, but this also has an issue because it takes time and uh, many education systems in Asian countries are actually failing. And also sustainability is a big issue. Everybody talk about that one. And uh, the debt is rising, so which lead to another equity problem, intergenerational equity. How about reducing public transfers for sustainability then? You can combine actually that, like uh, pension reform, for example. Uh, so old age poverty is an issue, by the way, in many countries, because many Asian countries are getting old before they get rich. Or actually even increase saving. So, what I'm saying is there are many, many policies. The holistic approach actually is not just from the fiscal policy. So the all policies that could be combined to consider how can we reduce the inequality actually. So that's actually a big, really, really big picture. So the second topic is uh, how can you find the target group? I mean, especially under the pandemic. So the effect of the pandemic is very different across generations. Employment, labor, income, and private consumption has been affected substantially. It's for working group. And children of work working groups are also affected. But elderly actually rely more on pension and savings rather than work. So the additional public support to boosting labor income actually would have a little impact on older people. So it has a bigger impact on working group. And uh, of course, government overall actually increased dramatically. So I have been working on this data set. Uh, I was actually chair uh, of this uh, uh, group network for uh, two years. So about 200 researchers actually working on this, this data set. So this data set may provide some useful information. 
Uh, so what is this data as the National Transport Council? It integrates the information from many, many different sources to provide a snapshot of the generational economy. So instead of saying, oh, how much we have, I mean, what is the tax I mean, amount? What is the tax revenue? What is the tax uh, uh, expenditure? It actually spreads out like this. So we draw an age profile of everything, almost everything. Labor income, so this is tax profile. Uh, so this is a tax uh, uh, burden, which is a tax. And this is benefit profile, and this is net. So this is per capita on the right hand side, you can see uh, the burden by AG and the benefit by AG in aggregate terms in national level. This, this is actual data, Thailand 2017, which is consistent with the national income and product accounts. Of course, Japan has a very, very different picture because uh, uh, their uh, spending, especially the payers under the uh, sorry, long term health care and the pension benefit is huge for elder, older people. So it shows a very, very different picture. So why I'm doing this? Because we have profiles of a lot of profiles. It takes actually a couple of years to construct one for one country. Then you can do a simulation and see how the impact of COVID-19 is different by age group or even by gender. So I think that's actually interesting exercise. This is the first paper. It just actually came out last week uh, uh, using uh, actually very complex model, uh, Miguel. So we commissioned this, this paper to him and uh, it leads to a, a different actual impact. So this is a PS means PS support, additional support to boost labor income. And PS 100 is 100% uh, actually, it's uh, based on some simulation. G zero means there is no support to boost labor income. And it has a huge impact on uh, young people, younger people and uh, working group but no effect on children. But if you can see actually there is huge differences across uh, uh, countries because their consumption profiles are different, labor income profiles are different, and age profiles of taxation and uh, age profiles of uh, benefit is different. So, uh, sorry, you can actually see the simulation results for the public budget debt and consumptions. So consumption losses is of course biggest for the working age group, prime age group, uh, but uh, not for the older people. So the, the, let me talk about the, briefly talk about the effectiveness of fiscal policy and reducing inequality. So this is uh, the, uh, you know, this is probably a common method that comparing just the disposable income Gini coefficient to with the market income Gini coefficient. And you can see this diagonal means actually there is no effect, right? No, no effect on fiscal policy. So as the further you actually move away from the diagonal line, it, it, uh, the more effective the fiscal policy is. So it's more, the blue dots are mostly European countries, and these are uh, Latin American countries mostly, and actually Korea is here. So why I'm showing actually Korea? Because uh, the effectiveness of a fiscal policy should be interpreted to equation. So we did actually using the Korea data, and we did it by age because again, my question is uh, how it affects uh, the different age group differently, right? So it has actually no impact, very little impact on other age group, but it has a huge impact on uh, on elderly. So it's actually effective to, to for poverty reduction. This is a relative poverty, by the way, not absolute poverty. So this is actually effective tool for poverty reduction for older people only. But if you just uh, uh, aggregate all the age group, it actually hides some picture, right? important picture of the, and this is very, very important because Korea is the, has the highest poverty rate, I mean, relative poverty rate of older in OECD countries. That's very well known, has the lowest fertility rate and highest poverty rate of older people. That's the two top one for Korea's economy. So this kind of, uh, I mean, we just by segregating the group of people, is important and uh, we are actually collecting data what happens after COVID-19. So uh, sustainable, I mean, we talk about sustainability. This is a social welfare spending as percent of GDP. And uh, I just keep uh, describing six, six countries. Uh, you can actually see the effect of financial crisis here. And uh, this one is actually the first one is Finland. The third one is Sweden. And uh, actually, Finland and Sweden shows a similar picture, but after 2008, 
I mean, every country's social spending increased. But after 2008, what happened? They are diverse. So that means actually it depends on uh, country's uh, policy, definitely. So we still don't know what would happen in the COVID after COVID-19. It probably depends on individual country's uh, policy. Uh, so again, based on some simulations, uh, uh, general equilibrium model uh, uh, <coughs> simulation, uh, it, the public debt that to output ratio actually changes uh, depending on uh, the public support, uh, either 0%, no, no intervention, or 100% intervention based on some assumptions. Um, okay. But many people actually worry about this uh, su sustainability or that. This is actual. This is a per capita government transfer uh, based on NTA data. So Thailand is actually as a ratio of uh, labor income is 30 to 49, so normalized. So you can see actually huge increase in Thai, uh, in many many countries, and especially Japan is very uh, notable for the uh, 25 or less to 25 years. And Korea has increased just uh, in six years because of the introduction of uh, um, uh, long-term health care. So the one actually simple simulation is uh, uh, how much the tax should have been increased to make a budget balance, no deficit. So this is actually actual tax profiles as a ratio of average labor income of Japan. Uh, Professor and, Lee, if you can wrap up in two minutes, please. Yeah, in one minute, just one Thank minute. You. Yeah. Thank you. And the right hand side is actually it should have been this way to make a fiscal balance in Japan. So that shows uh, how it's, uh, I mean, it's very difficult actually. Countries don't do that. So, concluding remarks, I talk about big picture, policy target growth, whether it's effective and sustainable. So, evidence driven policies are, of course, important. And also, targeting like a sole population by age, maybe by income level. But this is actually what I'm working on. I mean, we, our group of people have been working on this one. And of course, uh, there is no silver bullet. All countries are different. So let me stop there. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Lee, for laying out a very nuanced picture, uh, clear messaging on a holistic approaches needed to tackle inequality, not just fiscal policy. And the, even the effect of fiscal policy on inequality needs to be interpreted a little more carefully. It's not always the same for different countries. Thank you very much for this very as I said, nuanced uh, messaging on um, the need to look a little more carefully at the country level before prescribing certain policies. Let me turn to our last speaker, but certainly not the least, Ms. Sally Torbert. She's a senior program officer at International Budget Partnership. Sally, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much, and um, thank you to UNESCAP. It's uh, wonderful to be a part of this conversation today. Um, so uh, I am going to build on uh, my the previous presentations um, and uh, um, so uh, this really builds on the, the the previous discussion that's been had around okay so we're we're coming you know we're in COVID revenues are down uh, we're looking at reduced growth and so um, many countries are going to be facing difficult decisions about policies and and in a reduced uh, fiscal space so so there's going to be some tough decisions going forward so it's been my pleasure to work with the unescap team uh, for the past couple of months to be doing a review um, of some of the evidence from before the pandemic about what we know on which fiscal policies reduce inequality or conversely increase inequality. And with the aim of trying to inform some of the decisions that countries may need to make about which policies to prioritize in the coming years. Um, and so in this presentation, I'm going to give a brief overview of, of what we looked at um, in terms of you know, narrowing in on some specific aspects. And there's others that you could look at, um, showing you some of the results, giving you some of the examples that we found in some of the country assessments, and then a few conclusions. So uh, just to narrow in the conversation a little bit, because as um, Professor Lee um, before and, and Michal earlier highlighted, there's many factors in the question around which fiscal policies impact inequality. And I'm going to be speaking specifically to the question of, of taxes and transfers um, and which how they have a redistributive impact on household incomes. Of course, that's not the only way that fiscal policies impact inequality. We've, we've heard about how public investments 
Just a uh, minute, awesome. Sally, can you put it on slideshow? And um, because it's not in that mode, and I don't know if you're moving your slides, we can't see. It's going to message, but I think the team is running that. Okay. <laughs> oh, I think it's Sally. Let me try this again. How does that look? It is fine, it? but it's not on slide mode, actually. It's not on slideshow mode. Yeah. Okay, now you got it. Yeah. All right. Sorry about that. There we go. Try that again. Okay. Um, so yes, the uh, we were in other presentations. They've highlighted the fact that um, public investments in human capital also have uh, a kind of build-on effect or, or, or um, growth effect in that you know investments, for example, in early childhood education uh, also result in future productivity um, as well as intergenerational equality. As well as there's the questions of regulations that influence many factors in the economy, including access to finance, labor markets, other factors. So th there's more than one um, factor, of course, when you're making a policy decision and, and, and policymakers are making trade-offs between different elements. But I'll just be speaking, of course, to what we know about the redistributive impact of taxes and transfers. So there's two key sources of information that we looked at. Um, mainly there's the, the commitment to equity study, CEQ studies, um, uh, which are uh, they're, they're, they use a common methodological framework. They're done by the CEQ Institute of Tulane University. Um, so they're comparable across countries and they allow for the direct comparison of results across countries. We know, of course, every country is different, but it is useful to say, how does the policy in, in one country differ from, from another and then look at it and say, why? And to do that, you can actually build on what you see in CEQ studies with um, public expenditure reviews or PERs um, most of the ones that we looked at are from the World Bank, but they are non-standard, but they um, really dig into questions of efficiency, effectiveness, expenditure trends, um, and often do also include uh, equity analysis. So we had about 12 countries that we looked at in depth. Um, that include 10 CEQ studies and seven countries with PERs. In some of the countries, we also looked at systematic country diagnostics. I didn't put those here, but those are also, also useful resources uh, to look at when you're um, examining kind of in-depth questions about how does a policy work um, in a very country. Um, so you'll see this is not a representative sample of Asia Pacific, but it gives you a broad overview of, of, of quite a few countries and, and gives you some examples of types of policy interventions. So when looking at the impact of taxes and transfers with uh, in, uh, this redistributive analysis or an incidence analysis, um, there are three key elements that you can look at when thinking about what is the impact on inequality. So that includes, of course, the size of the fiscal policy, um, which is you know, the amount of, of revenue collected or, or, or expenditures. Um, and uh, that really impacts, of course, how much that the, the, the policy can impact uh, the actual size of transfers or, or collection of taxes from households. You also look at the progressivity of a particular measure, and that's the distribution of resources across the income scale. And that can be measured on a relative or an absolute basis. Um, but the principle is, is that as you know, benefits are concentrated in lower income groups, the more progressive a policy can be and the more impact it can have on inequality. And finally, there's the element of the composition of different policies. And this is where the CEQ analysis really um, comes into play because, of course, policies can interact with each other in that um, it, based on it's not just the simple analysis of a single policy that contributes to the overall impact of the fiscal system. And that as multiple policies impact a household, that can actually reorder their, their rank in, in the income distribution, which can change the overall impact on inequality. And CEQ studies actually incorporate that. So um, just a quick laying out of what types of policies are we talking about when we talk about taxes and transfers, and we're talking about spending and taxation policies. You can also group them in terms of kind of are there direct policies or indirect policies. Direct policies are, are ones that actually provide funding directly to a household. Indirect policies are more diffuse. Um, for example, a value added tax that is applied to, to, to across a wide range of goods and, and, and you can't necessarily attribute it specifically to a household, but you can generally map how much you expect a household is paying in that tax by seeing total amount and then how much you expect each household, uh, how much is collected and then out, how much each household would be expected to pay. 
So here's a quick overview of the results. Um, so the uh, highlights are that across the fiscal system, you do see every country, the overall fiscal system reduces inequality. And this is you're seeing the change in the Gini index, uh, Gini index on a scale of zero to 100. Um, that you'll see wide variations in the overall impact across countries. And this has been flagged in other presentations as well. Um, there's also a, a key element from the CEQ analyses in terms of the methodology, especially around contributory pensions, which can either be treated as deferred income or as a government transfer. And you can see that in some countries that have large contributory pension systems, especially Russia or Armenia, that actually results in a large difference in what the expected outcome would be in terms of reducing inequality. Now, those systems are, you know, it's probably the reality somewhere in the middle. So you would expect actually the overall impact to be somewhere in between the two extremes, but you see both methodologies presented here. Another point is that, you know, the, the size of spending impacts the overall um, fiscal system. This varies across the region. Just a quick snapshot to show that, you know, within the countries looked at, uh, spending as a, a total government expenditure as a share of G a GDP varies from 40% to 17% in the countries. And that's correlated, but not always entirely with actually the level of income. So some countries, of course, as is discussed many times elsewhere, do have space to increase the overall size of the government budget, which does impact the overall inequality as well. So uh, what does the data show us from the CEQ studies? So this is um, a graph similar to the one that Michal showed earlier um, that shows the, the impact of, of uh, expected impact on the vertical axis, the marginal contribution, that's the difference between market income and final income um, for different policies in different countries. Um, the UNESCO Asia Pacific are in green. A few points to note here is that note the, that spending tends to have more of an impact than taxes. That's expected. Taxes are not usually set out to reduce inequality, but of course they have that impact. Also they're due to raise revenues to fund spending policies you can see that um, indirect policies in particular in Asia Pacific do have a very um, a large impact, relatively large compared to other countries, increasing inequality. Um, also worth noting here uh, is that if you change the methodology, and this is now looking at pensions as uh, deferred income, so not as a government transfer, that direct transfers are relatively small in Asia Pacific as compared to the rest of the world um, when you don't look at the, when you kind of exclude the pension programs. So uh, here's another way of looking at the relative impact of policies. This is looking at health and education. You can see this a clear correlation for both higher spending leads to, to greater reduction in inequality. Some factors that um, impact it beyond just the level of spending could include for education, things like enrollment rates, how much actual benefits go to rural areas or poor families who tend to have lower enrollment rates in education, or for health spending, you'll see differences in health services, again, tend to be lower access in rural regions, or conversely, you see some paradoxical situations where health, um, services are so poor that the rich actually turn to private services and that actually increases the overall expected progress of of spending so that looks like it improves inequality but actually is a marker of an efficiency problem so there's a few case studies that flagged that so a quick few examples of of policies that um, could uh, reduce inequality or incre increase inequality i mentioned coverage of health services in, in rural areas you saw that in china Pension programs um, could potentially have a very large impact on inequality, but they also have fiscal sustainability risks. Um, tobacco excises mentioned earlier in this, in this conference um, have very strong health benefits, but do in fact increase inequality in several of the countries that looked at. So that's something to think about in terms of compensating for them through other fiscal policies. And then just to note that higher education, education spending in lower levels tends to be very good at reducing inequality, but higher education less so, again, has other benefits, but something to consider when looking at policies. A few quick reforms to think, a few quick points to think about reforms. I mentioned the role of indirect and direct taxes that's been widely discussed and understood. Um, but there's also to note that, that even uh, relatively regressive indirect taxes can have benefits and actually result in an overall decrease in inequality if the revenues are used to fund progressive direct transfers. 
Um, in terms of raising revenue, there's also options to reduce tax exemptions or tax breaks. One finding that is consistent is that subsidy programs are not an effective way to reduce inequality. Um, and there's been reforms in, in countries such as Iran and Indonesia that are, are, are shifting away from subsidy programs to more targeted transfers. And again, pension programs, Professor Lee mentioned them, um, can be very effective, but there are sustainability issues. So final few thoughts. Um, just to note that this, of course, excludes quite a few things. Um, that includes things like looking at the efficiency and effectiveness of health spending. Um, it doesn't cover corporate or property taxes, which can be um, pretty good drivers of inequality reduction simply because they're hard to attribute to households. Um, direct um, transfer programs can be very effective, not as many in the Asia Pacific, but there are a few examples such as Armenia, the, the um, Family Benefits Program or the Pekayaj Program in Indonesia that for their relatively small amount of spending are actually very good at reducing inequality. Um, and that generally, I guess, a final point would be these, these studies are very useful to, to, for countries to look at and, and think about when they're considering policy trade-offs. So thanks so much and back over to you. Thank you so much, Sally. Um, for laying out again a clear case, how and when and what kind of fiscal policies can work and cannot work and what are the nuances there. Um, we are almost out of time, but I want to take at least one question. And so let me ask one question to all three participants here. Uh, it sort of captures the essence of our discussion. There are many questions that emerge from your presentations, but um, let me ask this one question. So if you have to advise one message to policymakers, what is the most common misperception of policymakers on inequality reduction via fiscal policy? If you want to highlight don't do that, at least when you talk about fiscal policy uh, in terms of reducing inequality. Or you can flip the question the other way around, which is one message you want to give, only one thought um, to policymakers, what would be their advice be if they can only pick one thing? Yes, Jonathan. So, I mean, you know, we used to emphasize the importance of um, really keeping your fiscal house in order and and keeping debt at moderate levels and and all of the things that that led to to austerity effectively um i think those messages should not be forgotten but the but the other side which is that many many countries even after the massive run up in debt in this pandemic uh, still retain substantial fiscal space. And for those countries, I think the, the lesson from the global financial crisis and its aftermath is that um, putting on the fiscal brakes uh, before the private sector can really uh, sustain uh, uh, momentum of private demand is, is self-defeating. And it, it's not wise from a, from a macro point of view, and it's not wise from a distributional point of view. For those countries that don't retain fiscal space, and I think um, for many uh, developing countries, it's not that they don't have fiscal space now, it's that they didn't have it to begin with, and they certainly don't have it now. Um, the, the goal has to be prioritizing, and I think the, the Cape Verde's presentation um, I spoke a little bit to, to prioritization, but, but I, I do think that there is where Sort of the political economy of of doing uh the right thing is is you, you need strong institutions to be able to prioritize because those who are um beneficiaries of fiscal largesse may not be the ones at the bottom they may be those at the top and and getting around that problem is thorny I'll, I'll stop there excellent message excellent <laughs> message uh, for both kind of countries uh those who have fiscal space and those who don't and that's what the whole issue is Professor Lee, Sally, your thoughts? I, I can say something. I mean, it's a very simple. It's uh, really when I actually talk to, uh, you know, policymakers and actually some ministers or politicians, especially, uh, they sometimes stress that, I mean, fiscal space, or oh, we have a fiscal space uh, and uh, we don't. And sometimes they confuse actually the level from growth. So in some countries, actually, the level of social spending as percent of GDP is low. But it has been growing most rapidly in some countries because of population aging and because of the political you know, will. So just the one part, I mean, the two parties actually say different things. One party say, oh, we should spend money because we have a fiscal space. The other party says that it has been increased to like a 10% per annum. 
So that's the one message. I mean, it's a so simple message, and depending on what figure you see, I mean, they actually insist on something different. Okay. But you will still recommend spending, but look at the data carefully where you're coming from. If you're I, being stop actually, so I have some <laughs> ideas. <laughs> Fair enough. So let, let me not try to put words in your mouth. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> Sally, over to you. Last words. Oh, thank you. No, I think I'd, I'd, I'd echo what Professor Leaf said. I think the, there's always, um, I think there's opportunities in thinking about taxes and spending together and that reforms are tough, you know, in any either, whether you're trying to expand fiscal space and add a new tax, you can kind of ease the blow by adding in some very popular kind of transfers to compensate for, for the impact that you'll have. Tobacco taxes, for example, pair that with a nice, good pro poor transfer and you can that that works and, and that can go forward and you're going to get much less resistance. So I think thinking about both sides of the fiscal system together and then what can get sold and what can get people behind it, I think is, is always useful and 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 yeah, is feasible in terms of reform wise. So yeah. Thanks, Sally. Thanks, Sally. This is extremely useful. The kind of messages, we, as I said, we have been trying to put out there in discussions with the policymakers and through our research here also, is we have been talking about a proactive role for fiscal policy, but that does not automatically mean a green light to go and spend irrespective of what's the structure of your economy, what the situation of your fiscal balance is and all that, and where you're spending it. The gains to be had from efficiency, for instance, right? So. Uh, it, 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 we, this time we want to get into the little more nitty gritty of our messaging and say, look, yes, we have been advising and, you know, go for more proactive fiscal policy. However, you need to be very, very careful when you go about it. It's not a green light, say, keep spending and then don't worry about sustainability issues, the effectiveness issue, the inefficiency issues and all those aspects. Thank you very much, Jonathan Ostry, Sally Torbert and Professor sang Lee. It has been a pleasure to learn from you once again, and um, we look forward to your interactions further. Shweta might bother you later on once we have a draft chapter, so we'll just have a quick look and fine tune some of the messaging side. We'll be grateful for that, and it has been extremely productive. I hope the, speak, uh, the participants enjoyed. Very rich, very technically sound advice, not just rhetoric, so really enjoyed that. Shweta, any last thoughts from you? Your, your mute, yes, Shweta. yes, yes, I think thanks actually for reminding that we will come back with our chapters a little bit later <laughs> for your <laughs> for your comments and your views a little bit later. And just to remind the participants that we have another session on monetary and financial policies for inclusive development at 2 p.m. So join us later again. So thank you all, Jonathan, Sally and, and Professor Lee. It was a wonderful session. <laughs> thank you, colleagues. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.